morning, everyone. It's good to see you out here this morning. Welcome, Ola, here in Nuanza Marin Onda. And that's good to Ola here to sign for the Os Maris. Fair me wieder gun. Da wir eine Klima in unserem Bulletin entschicken. Marin's U is Hof A is Church Council meeting. Tomorrow at 7 30, Church Council meeting. And also up there is Wednesday and Thursday school cleaning. And do on, on the other side, we read uh, school cleaning is July 19 and 20. It has done, as has been done for many years now, and kindly ask the parents of the Linda Vista school students assist in cleaning the school building in preparation for the coming year. There's a sign up sheet in the back of the church. Um, kindly sign up or contact Sucron for one of the two days uh, of cleaning. And those that have not signed up will receive an additional $100 fee for, to help cover the cost of the cleaning. Uh, plan to pressure wash on the 19th and clean the inside on the 20th. And also under the Linda Vista School is still in need of a few high school teachers for the upcoming school year. If anyone is interested, uh, or feels called to serve in this in this capacity, uh, call uh, let one of the school board members know or Principal Stanley. Uh, please pray that the right teachers would be found soon so that uh, high school can start on time. And uh, next Sunday evening at 7 p.m. Uh, is the quarterly membership meeting, and. And they had received positive feedback from the format that we had had at the last meeting. And so this, and at this meeting, the three boards and committees highlighted will be the Church Council Executive Clinic Board and the Mission Board. And if you would like to really find out and see what these boards or committees are all about, come on, come on out and you can participate in the, um, in the uh, membership meeting. Uh, record a reporter as available and uh, and copies do hang uh, when you day and to see and down uh, please uh, do and do a ping. Uh, park committee would also remind that those who are using the park in the evenings, if you're the last one to leave, please turn off the lights. Cost us quite a bit of electricity to let those lights burn all night long. So if you're the last one there, please turn them off. Just a reminder from the park committee. And also, if there's a running toilet, please let one of them know, one of the uh, committee's members know. Um, and also, uh, Sunday School Committee is preparing a Bible handout in August for kids born in 2018 and 2015. And the names are posted on the back on the bulletin board. And just if you notice somebody that was born in those years and uh, their name isn't up there, please put down the information there so that the Sunday School Committee uh, won't miss anybody. And just uh, another note, if you feel led and are ready to be baptized, uh, just talk to one of the pastors, uh, or if you would like to take up membership here in our church, talk to them as well. Um, let's uh, open in prayer. And then I'll call the worship team up to lead us in worship. Dear Lord Jesus, thank you for this beautiful morning. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your presence. And I thank you for your greatness. And Lord, um, we anticipate your, your teaching us this morning. And we anticipate um, your presence here this morning. And Lord, as we go through the worship service, I pray that we'd have open hearts and minds to, to your word to your teaching, and also uh, to freely express our worship towards you. Lord, uh, I thank you for healing, as I just saw Jake uh, walk into our church building this morning, and Lord, I just want to thank you for that. And I also want to pray for the Peter Fair family, as they have lost a family member this last week. Lord, I pray to be with them and grant them, grant them uh, peace as they go through the healing process. 
Lord, I just want to thank you for your presence here this morning. I praise your name. Amen. Good morning. Let's sing, Be Thou My Vision.
Where you go, I'll go. Where you stay, I'll stay. When you move, I'll move. I will follow. We're singing that here, and we're promising us something. We're going to follow God, and then Monday happens, and life happens, right? Um, this next song that we're singing is I Will Lift My Hands. It's written by Chris Tomlin. He co-writes it with Louis Giglio and Matt Mayer. And I will read it the way he spoke it. The song comes out of a struggle Louis had with anxiety and panic. He was struggling with health issues and he felt like everything was shutting down. I remember he would say that at night, everything was dark and consuming. So many people are there and can relate to what that feels like in the night. Louis would just start singing to God and lift his hand to God in his bed. I still don't know the tune of Louis' song, but he came to me with the words, this is Chris Tomlin speaking. He came to me with these words, be still my soul, there is a healer. His love is deeper than the sea. His mercy is unfailing. His fortress is for the weak. I lift my hands to believe again. When he sent me those lyrics, he said, if this hits you in any way for a song, to let him know. And I was like, yes, it's already there. So the song became, I lift my hands from reading Psalm 28. David seems to have been in that same place. Hear my cry for mercy as I call to you for help, as I lift my hands toward you, most holy place. I pour out my heart these things I remember 
team. That stretched my voice a little bit. That's good. Um, can I get the uh, ushers to get ready for the offering and to ask God's blessing on that before we take it. Lord Jesus, thank you for this day again. Thank you for the strength and energy you've given us through this last week, the opportunities you've given us to provide, to earn. And Lord, um, as you have blessed us with those opportunities and, and the and the talents to be able to do that. Lord, I pray you'd help us to remember that where they come from, they all come from you. And Lord, as we give back to your service, Lord, I pray it would be a blessing to those who receive and those, those who can use it. Praise pray your name.
thanks for your gifts. Uh, next, for the kids, we've got a, Gisela has prepared a special presentation for you, so if you would like to come up to the front to have a more personal interaction with Gisela, please come on up. So all the kids, if you want to come up. Good morning, children. I'm wondering, have any of you seen a clown before or a payaso? I think there's a picture up front there. Could someone hold it up for me, please? Okay, he probably looked pretty silly and did funny things to make others laugh. I enjoy clowns, except for this one clown. Well, anyway, today we are going to talk about listening and doing, specifically listening to God's word and doing what it says. See, it's very good to listen and pay attention to what God says. But the Bible says that if you listen to God's word and don't do what it says, you're like a man who looks into a mirror and then immediately forgets what he looks like. I didn't really understand what that verse meant until I went to a friend's birthday party last year. We were all super excited for this birthday party because my friend's mom was going to hire a clown. I really like clowns. Clowns are great. They're hilarious and so much fun. I actually know some clowns that use clowning to go and tell other people about Jesus, which is awesome. And we were all so excited because, you know, well, we didn't know exactly what he was going to do. We figured maybe he'd make some balloon animals, maybe he'd sing some songs, or maybe he'd tell some funny jokes. We didn't know what to expect, but we knew, we knew that it would be so much fun because that is what a clown is supposed to be. But that is not what this clown was. Mm -mm. This was a very lame clown. Now his makeup was pretty good, and he looked like a clown. But this guy did not do anything a clown does. He literally just stood there. The whole party. I think I heard him say, hey kids, like once. And I think I saw him eat a piece of cake. And that's it. He just stood there doing nothing. It was as if he spent all day, you know, doing his makeup, getting the costume, and he looked in the mirror and said, yeah, I'm a clown, and then turned around and totally forgot what he looked like. He totally forgot that he was a clown, and it was so lame, but I think that we as Christians sometimes do the same thing. The Bible says that we are loved by God, that we are God's children. Jesus died for us, and he wants us to tell other people about Jesus and about God's love for them and for us. He died for us and saved us from our sins, and that's good news for us and for others. Sometimes we hear all this good stuff in the Bible, and then we forget it. We go out in the world, and we live like none of that is true. We forget the things that we have learned. We forget the good things that God has done for us and the good things we should do for others and for God. We're like that clown that did nothing a clown does. And so my challenge to you guys today is that we would, yes, absolutely learn what God has to say. Study our Bibles, go to church. We can spend our whole life learning about God and still have so much left to learn. The challenge is not just to listen to God's word, but to do what it says. Don't just listen to God, but do what he says. We were made to do amazing things for God. He has done so much for us, and we were meant to do more, much more than just listen. God wants us to be not only hearers of the word, but doers of the word. All right. To help us to remember this clown, we have brought along some balloons. So each of you can take a balloon home today and remember that we are to act as and live as Jesus did, that we don't forget, that we don't just listen, but that we remember to do what God's word says. Thank you. I have the balloons right there, my dad. Oops, I guess we forgot to put the balloons in the right place.
Yeah, Gina and Avery will be handing them out. So if the kids that want to head out that way, you can pick one up with Gina there, and the ones that come this way, you can pick one up with Avery. Avery, you want to come stand right over here? That way they can pass on to the hallway. Thank you so much for listening. Have a good week. Thank you, Gisela. Next, we'll have the sermon from Pastor Henry. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Good morning. It is good to be here this morning. And thank you very much, Gisela, for that uh, story. She told my message, so we can go home now. That is basically what I'm speaking about, or that is what I'm speaking about. It is uh, doing what we are hearing. Hearing uh, God's word isn't enough, but we also need to do God's word. So before I go on to the message, uh, is everyone comfortable? Are you cold? Are you warm? I don't know if I'm not feeling very well, but I felt a little cold there. Like, uh, should the fans be turned off, or do you want them on? On. All right. Well, if no one is cold, then uh, I guess uh, uh, for once I feel a little cold in Belize. And I think maybe that's because I'm a little nervous, so it's okay then. Very good. Last uh, Sunday, I, spoke, I started speaking out of the book of James in chapter 1, the first half of the, of the chapter. And for those of you that were here, you will remember that we talked about testing and persevering. And uh, from the very beginning, James uh, encourages his uh, readers, his, uh, uh, his audience to rejoice in the midst of suffering and hardship. The first half of the chapter, he calls us uh, to go higher, to go greater, and to trust deeper as we journey through life towards the eternal promise that we have in Christ Jesus. And through that, very often there we encounter trials, we encounter hardships, we encounter all kinds of uh, different issues in our life. And he says, uh, rejoice in that. So, and uh, this week, we, we're going to finish uh, James chapter 1. Uh, James encourages uh, uh, his readers to do both, to be hearers of the word and to be doers of the word. James didn't have a lot of patience for people that just came and listened to the word and never did anything. Now, James was a good pastor. He was a good leader. He was a leader of the uh, Jerusalem church. He was a half-brother of Jesus Christ. And he, was, uh, he wanted what was uh, best for his people. And uh, before I go into the passage that I want to uh, mainly speak on today, I want to finish last week's uh, sermon. Last week, I wanted to go all the way through verse 18 uh, but I ended with, uh, with uh, verse 12. And just a brief reminder, verse uh, 12. Let's actually bow our head in uh, prayer uh, before we go further. Heavenly Father, we come before you. And God, I thank you for this morning. I thank you that your presence is with us. I thank you for each one that came out this morning. And Father, I just pray that your, uh, your presence will be with us. I pray that the spirit of love and that the spirit of acceptance will be here. And Father, I pray that uh, each one, everyone that came out this morning, that they will feel comfortable and that they will feel accepted here and that they will feel your love, your presence here, Lord. Father, I pray that, you were, that your uh, spirit will speak in and through me. Father, I pray that you will help me to pace myself and to allow you to speak. Holy God, I thank you so much for, for this beautiful this beautiful country that we can live in, this beautiful community that we can live in and be part of. So, Father, I just uh, ask your presence to be with us here. And may, may my words be pleasing and acceptable to you, Lord. So, Father, we thank you and we praise you in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. If you have your Bibles with you, open them to James chapter 1. 
I will be reading out of the NIV Bible. Uh, now, I don't know if you have noticed, I've uh, noticed this lately, like if you have a paper copy, uh, maybe it's an older version of the NIV, but it's, uh, it's different than the online NIV. Uh, my Bible uh, uh, refers to brothers, and the online Bible says brothers and sisters. And there's few words like that that are different, or, uh, but uh, this morning I will be reading out of uh, my paper Bible. So, James chapter 1, and like I said, uh, last week we ended with uh, verse 12, and verse, uh, verse 12 says this way, Blessed is the man who perseveres under trial, because, because when he has been... Sorry, let me start again. Blessed is the man who perseveres under trial, because when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life that God has promised those who love him. That is where we ended last week. And uh, from there, uh, it's almost like James goes back a little bit when he goes into 13. He, he goes back, almost like if he goes back to uh, when you're still uh, in perseverance, when you're still in this life here. Like uh, we aren't done with life yet. yet. So let's uh, read from verse 13 on. It says, uh, when tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when, by his own evil desires, is dragged away and enticed. Then, after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. Let's stop here a little bit. What is James saying here? He says, uh, he's talking about, uh, before this, the verses he's talking about, he's talking about persevering. He's talking about hardship in life. And he says, uh, in verse 13, he says, when you have finished, when you're, uh, when it almost makes it sound like those that, uh, that do well, those that finish, you will receive the crown of glory. Well, that is what he's saying. But then he goes on and he says, now when you are tempted, when temptation comes, you're in hard times, when temptation comes, do not say that you're tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor will he tempt anyone. He says, when you're tempted, when you're dragged away, it says it is by your own evil desires. You're tempted when by, uh, through your own evil desires, you allow yourself to be dragged away. And when, that is, uh, when the, your evil desires give in to, uh, you, through that you give in to sin. And then when sin is fully grown, it gives birth to death. So, and then he goes on in verse uh, 16, he says, don't be deceived, my dear brothers. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. He chose to give us birth through the word of truth, that we might be a kind of first fruit of all he created. He says, now don't be deceived. Everything that is good, every good gift that you've ever received, everything, anything that is good comes from God. It comes from, it says, uh, it comes from the Father of the heavenly lights. Now, what, what does he mean when he talks about the heavenly lights? He's talking about the Father of the moon, the sun, the stars. He's talking about that Father, the Father that created all of that. Every good thing that you've ever received came from him. And he sa it goes on and he says, and he does not change like shifting shadows. Again, he's referring to the sun, the moon, and the stars. The, the sun and the moon, they shift, they move. The shadows, like, uh, the, it moves. It's a, it, uh, it moves all the time, and he says, God does not change. He says, God will always stay the same. He says, everything good comes from that Father, from that God. Uh, everything that, that we have that is good comes from him, and he will never change. He will always stay the same. And then I like the way he ends it. He says that we might be a kind of first fruit of all he created. Now, what is he talking about a first fruit? What is a first fruit? Now, I don't know exactly what it all entails here, but the way, I, the way this spoke to me is the first fruit. We will be the only thing that he created that will go into eternity into eternal condemnation or into to eternity with the Lord. He says, if we allow His Word that He has planted in us to do a work, then we will go into eternity. We will be a first fruit of something that He created. Amen. 
Now it's important to remember that James, he was a good leader who deeply cared for his church. And at times he may sound harsh. At times it sounded like uh, he was kind of beating on his people. He's like, people, wake up. And, uh, but we need to remember that he was, uh, he was, his intentions were good. He cared for the people of his uh, congregation and he cared that people would not just listen to the word but that they would act it out, that they would move forward. He said, it's almost like he said, people, we don't have time for lukewarm faith. You are either in or you're not. He says, because the decisions that you will make, it may cost you your life. Because that church was under persecution at that time. He says, if you just want to come and you just want to be a, a half Christian, you want to uh, be, yeah, I want to have that good feeling, I want to know that I'm good, but you don't want to uh, step up and do something, do what, it, what the Bible calls you to do. He says, people, we don't have time for that. It may cost you your life. And that begs a question for us today. Would some severe, some uh, external persecution, would that increase our faith? Would that increase our lifestyle? Because we have it so good. This morning I was reminded of how good we have it in the community that we live in. We look out for one another. And we are sheltered from a lot of things. We have it really good. But James says that that alone doesn't cut it. Now, I just want to make one thing clear here. James talks a lot, like I said last week, he talks about doing. Now, doing, we are not going to earn our salvation. That's not what James is talking about. He's not saying that you have to do all these things in order to earn your salvation. That's not what he's talking about. But he's talking to a group of people that are already Christians. He's talking to a group like you, like us here, who profess to be Christians. And he's saying, now, you are Christians. There ought to be some fruits. You ought to do some things. <clears throat> Before I go into our passage here today, I want to uh, uh, read a couple of verses out of Matthew uh, chapter 20, uh, 21, verse 28 through 30, uh, 32. You don't need to go there if you don't want to. It's a, it's the, this is Jesus speaking. He, it says it like this. What do you think? There was a man who had two sons. He went to the first one. Uh, he went to the first and said, "Son, go and work today in the vineyard." "I will," he answered. But later he changed his mind. Sorry. He, uh, let me start it again. Uh, verse 29. He says, "I will not." But uh, he answered. But later he changed his mind and went. Then the father went to the other son and said the same thing. He answered, "I will, sir." But he did not go. Which of the two did what the father wanted? The first they answered. Jesus said to them, Truly I tell you, the tax collectors and prostitutes are entering the kingdom of God ahead of you. For John came to you and showed you the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and prostitutes did, and even after you saw this, you did not repent and believe. Now in this passage, Jesus is making a powerful point about listening and doing. Jesus says that the tax collectors and the prostitutes, now you need to remember the tax collectors and the prostitutes, they were uh, so considered the bad people in those times. They were way down there. They, they were looked down upon. And Jesus says that they will enter uh, the kingdom before uh, the, uh, the Pharisees and the teachers of the law before the good people. He says, because they listened to what John the Baptist had to say. And the people, the church-going people, they did not. So he says that those people will enter the kingdom of heaven before you will because they listened. They listened and they acted. They did something about it. They repented. Now with that in mind, Let's, uh, let's jump into the, uh, James chapter 1 here again. I will read from uh, verse 19 all the way through uh, 27. It says, My dear brothers, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. For man's anger does not bring about the righteous life that God desires. Therefore, get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent and humbly accept the word planted in you, 
which can save you. Now this is a, he's uh, talking back, or uh, ties together with, uh, with uh, verse uh, 14 here, I believe it was, where he's talking about the word that, uh, that, that we have. So uh, the 22, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourself, do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like a man who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgetting what he looks like. But the man who looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues to do this, not forgetting what he has heard but doing it, he will be blessed in, in what he does. If anyone considers himself if anyone considers himself religious and yet does not keep a tight rein on his tongue, he deceives himself and his religion is worthless. Religion that God the Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. This far. Now James is addressing his audience uh, as uh, dear brothers, as dear brothers and sisters. Now you need to remember that James, uh, like I said before, he cared for his people. He, it, it was like, it, almost like he says, dearly beloved church, listen to what I'm going to tell you. Listen to the words that I'm going to say. And then he starts out, he says, be quick to listen, listen and slow to speak and slow to become angry. Be quick to listen. Now we all know, we all have two ears and one mouth. And that means that we should listen twice as much as, what, as uh, we speak. And sometimes growing up, I, I spoke twice as much as I listened. And uh, well into my adult years, my wife oftentimes had to remind me I wasn't done speaking yet. He, she would tell me something and I would, uh, she was halfway through her uh, uh, sentence or through the uh, thing that she wanted to tell me and all, I already started replying. I already had everything figured out and I was going to answer her. And she sometimes had to remind me, can you just listen? And that's what James is uh, saying here. Listen twice as much as you, uh, be, uh, be uh, quick to listen but slow to speak. Now there's an old saying, my dad told me this joke. Now this makes better sense in German than it does in English, but I'll see if, it, I, see if I can do this in English. There's a, a man walking down the road. Oh, how does it go again? There's a man walking down the road uh, with his son, and he tells his son ab about this. He says, you always need to listen, uh, you need to think before you speak. And now they're walking down the road there, and he's taught his son pretty well. And uh, somehow his dad, uh, uh, overall, his coat has caught on fire. And the son, he's uh, saying, Dad, I'm thinking. Dad, I'm thinking. Dad, I'm thinking, but you're on fire. So he was th really thinking this through before he spoke. Now there he should have just said, Dad, your coat is on fire. But he was doing what his dad had taught him. He was thinking three times before he would speak. And that's kind of the idea that James is telling us here. He says, you need to listen before you speak. Be slow to get angry, James says, because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. Not only can our anger lead us into sin, but it can ruin our witness as Christians. And it can ruin our relationships that we have around us. Now, I don't know about, uh, has anyone here ever, when you're really upset about uh, something or about uh, an individual, and you've just got up and you've given them a piece of your mind, you've told them how it was, and you walked away from there thinking, yeah, they'll, they'll know that I'm a Christian. They, yeah, they'll come to Christ now because I really let them have it. Doesn't work that way, does it? And I was reminded of, uh, of some years back, on a Sunday morning, we went to, we were, I, I don't quite remember if we were on our way to church or if we were on our way to, uh, to a, a different town. But anyways, we were going, uh, we got up early and we went to Tim Hortons and we were going to go through a drive through there to pick up a coffee, pick up our breakfast, and then we were going to be on the road. 
and we're sitting in line there, and there's a car that comes and, uh, and uh, cuts me off, just pulls, out, uh, pulls in right a, uh, ahead of me here, and I grab for the door handle. I'm going to get out, and I'm going to go give them a piece of my mind. And my wife grabs my arm, and she says, what are you doing? And I was steaming mad. Now, if I would have gone to that person, that lady, and told her, hey, you cut, just cut in front of me here, walk back into my car, that lady wouldn't know. She would think that I was a maniac. Sometimes we act before we think. And I praise the Lord for my wife to hold me back, or else I probably would have done that. I surprised myself how that angered me so much. And as I sat there in this lineup for a little while, and I looked at the license plate, and I was like, this car is from out of province. They probably don't know how we do things here. But even if that person knew that the lineup was back there, so what if I had to wait a little longer? And James goes on to say, he says, get rid of all your moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent. Get rid of it. Everything that is evil within you, everything that, uh, that makes you upset, get rid of it. Now I want to challenge all of us here today, including myself. We are supposed to do what we hear. So when we go from here later on, and the Holy Spirit convicts us of something and, and tells us that there is something that you need to repent of, do it. Don't just say, ah, oh, yeah, I'll do it some other time. Do it. Repent. Come before the Lord and say, Lord, I have failed. And then James goes on to say, and he says, humbly accept the word that is planted in you, which can save you. The word of God is powerful and important in our life. There is nothing more important than the, than the, the, there's nothing more important except for maybe God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, although I don't know that we would know about God the Father if, we'd, if it wasn't for the Word, for His Word. So His Word, the Word of God is important in our life. And James says it is planted in you. You have the Word of God. Now do something with it. Live it out. We must receive the word into our lives and then we must learn to throw everything off that is hindering us. We must learn to throw the things off that are, that are a hindrance in our life and we must learn to throw the things off, uh, off and to pray against the things that want to come into our life and steal, kill and destroy us. The next line in this uh, the chapter here, uh, in the book of James here, verse 21, uh, uh, commentaries and uh, theologians believe that this is the heart of the message here. And this is what it says. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourself. Do what it says. Now can you imagine that if a couple goes to a doctor and the doctor delivers a newborn child, a perfectly healthy child. There's absolutely, this is just a beautiful child. And the parents just stand there and stare at the child for the rest of their life. Now that's hard to imagine, right? And that's kind of the picture that James is painting here. If you're just hearing the word of life, if you're born again, you, are, you have new life in you. And you just stand and do nothing. And just look at it. Yeah, I have the Word of God in here, but I'm not going to do anything. I'm not going to act on it. That's kind of the picture that James is point, uh, painting here. He says, you need to act. You need to do something. And like I said before, not so that you will be saved, but because you are children of God. And if, uh, as a child of God, there is a standard that, there are, that our Father wants us to live up to. That he, want, that he desires from us. My children know that 
they need to pull their weight in our family. They can't just sit around and do nothing. When they have uh, finished eating, they take their plate and they put, put it on, uh, on the counter. And they do the dishes and we help around the house. And our Heavenly Father says, you are my children, my precious chi uh, children. Help along. There is many children, there's many people that aren't saved. There's many people in this world that don't know Jesus Christ. He says, live in such a way that, the, that you will uh, be a reflection of Jesus Christ. Twenty-three, anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it, uh, what it says is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself goes, goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. Now this is the, uh, the uh, story that Gisla had here and thank you very much for, for doing that. It is like a clown that looks in the mirror, he's a clown and then just goes and stands somewhere forgetting that he's a clown. Children around there, they're like, what's going on? I thought this clown was supposed to tell jokes or do stuff, but he's just standing there. It's kind of like you come to church and you listen to the preacher speak, and you go out the door and you forget what he said. Or it's kind of like in the morning you get up and you take your Bible, you take your devotional, and you read that, you close it, and you move on, you forget what you read. At the end of the Sermon of the Mount, Jesus says this, Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts, them into, and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on a rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the wind blew and beat against the house, yet it did not fall because, it, because he had its foundation on the rock. And when it talks the foundation on the rock, it's talking on the rock of Jesus Christ. It says, anyone who hears these words and puts them into practice is like that house that's built on the rock of Jesus Christ. As believers, we are called to be people of action. The Great Commission, the first word that, uh, that, uh, that is in the Great Commission, it says, go. It's an action. It says, go and tell all the world. Don't forget the word and don't take your eyes off of Jesus Christ. Now I'm sure we've all said things that we regret. I'm getting ahead of myself here a little bit. Verse 26, 26 and 27. Those who consider themselves religious and yet do not keep a tight rein on their tongue deceive themselves and their religion is worthless. Now if you're a Christian, if you profess to be a Christian, but your words, you don't keep a tight rein on your tongue, when you get upset, the words just fly He says, you're deceiving yourself. It's a worthless religion. Now, we've all said things that we regret, and we've all said, uh, said things that we wish we could take back. And that's not what, uh, what uh, uh, James is talking about here. He's not talking about the occasional slip-up, the occasional uh, thing where we said things that we regret, but he's talking about people that continuously live in that. They profess to be one thing, but their actions show something else. It says, you're deceiving yourself. That is not a fruit that the Bible talks about. He says, if you want to have a pure religion... Now, by the way, you're all religious people. We are all religious people. We all profess to be Christians. And in today's world, 
it doesn't matter. I've, I've uh, talked to people that, that, are of, that I know that aren't Christians. I was on the uh, last time when I flew to Canada on the plane. I was sitting for four hours next to a, a gentleman, and we were visiting. And the first half of the trip, he was uh, uh, cussing and cursing about this and about that. And he was just telling me all this and that, how his life had gone and whatnot. And then finally, he's asked, and what about you? And I told him, I'm a preacher. And then, oh, yeah, yeah, I'm a Christian too. And then his tone changed, and he started backtracking some of the things. Yeah, I grew up in the church. Uh, my parents, they used to always go to church, but uh, we stopped because the church did us wrong and, we, and all this and all that. And, and he had a long list of, uh, of excuses, but yet he was a Christian. Now, I'm no one to judge him because I don't know him. But the people that we know, the people that are around us, the people that profess to be Christians, we keep them to, to a higher standard because that's what the Bible teaches. When you see a brother sin, go and talk to him. A brother or a sister, when you see them sin, go and talk to them. Ask them, do you know that what you're doing is actually not right? And you hear them out, how come you are doing this? How come you are living this? What's going on in your life? And if they'll trust you, they'll tell you. If they feel that you deeply care about them, they will, they will tell you. But if they feel that you're just coming to, to see what kind of a rumor you can pick out of him to carry further, they're not going to open up to you. But if we allow the love of Jesus Christ to flow in and through us, and we go and sit with such a person, and we say, by the way, your lifestyle isn't matching up what you profess to be. What's going on in your life? How come you're doing what you're doing? Tell me about it. He says, if you want to have a religion that is worth something to God, look after widows and orphans, and he says, keep yourself from being polluted by the world. Be doers of the word and not hearers only. Now these are, I didn't like this very much when James talks so much about being doers of the word because it challenges me. It is easy just to, uh, to get together on Sunday and listen to God's word and go on and live my own selfish life. That is easy. But when he says, now be doers of the word, he says, people, I love you so much. The father says, I love you. I cared for you. I gave up my only son for you so that you can have a relationship with me. Now, all I'm asking is just for you to live out a Christian life and to keep a tight rein on your tongue. Don't just let the words fly when you're frustrated, but rather deal with it. And allow the Holy Spirit to work in, in, uh, in you. Allow Him to, to cleanse you. When there's this filthiness in our life, when there's uh, these words that so easily come to us and we just want to speak them, Allow the Holy Spirit to work in you and you repent of it. And then tomorrow you mess up again and, and uh, don't condemn yourself, but you go back to the cross and you say, Lord, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I did it again. Forgive me. God is gracious and merciful and He will forgive. And if it keeps happening, keeps happening, then perhaps you go to a brother and you ask, brother or sister, and you ask, please pray for me. I am weak in this area. I keep falling. I need your help. Surround me with your prayer. And find out what root of bitterness is in me that I need to get rid of. And for those of, uh, of you that are living this life, that are doers of the word, praise the Lord. Be encouraged. Continue doing that.
just some questions that all of us can ask ourselves. Do my words align with the Christian witness that I profess? Am I letting anger turn into sin? Am I stubborn? What have I done lately in response to my faith? Do I talk more than what I act? Does listening even matter if I don't respond? Now I'm sure there is probably more questions that are going through your mind. But consider these questions. And especially the last one, it really stuck with me. Does listening even matter if I don't respond? Now we all at one point were a child. And for those of you that have children, if you tell your children what to do, and you find out, and you're, you know that they have heard you, they have uh, responded, they have, have either nodded their head or, uh, head or they have said, yes, I will do it. But then later on, you find out they never did that. It doesn't feel very good, does it? It doesn't feel good being ignored. And I sometimes wonder how our Heavenly Father must feel with His people. Because I, I know there was a point in my life when I was going through struggles, I was going through hard times, and I cried out to God, and I said, God, if you will just help me through this thing, I will serve you for the rest of my life. I will do whatever you want me to do. I will go wherever you want me to go. I will do whatever you, my agenda is not going to matter anymore. It's yours. And he helped me, and I walked my own selfish way. How many times have you promised God that just help me through this one more thing and I will, I will serve you for the rest of my life? And then when he helps, we turn around and walk our own selfish way again. So this week, when the Spirit speaks to you, when the Holy Spirit speaks to you and he says, go, be obedient. When he says go into prayer, be obedient. When he says go read the word, be obedient. When he says go encourage someone, be obedient. When he says go and make things right, be obedient. Whatever the Spirit tells you, do it. Put it into action. That's close. Uh, may the worship team come up as we uh, close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you that we have your word. We thank you that you are with us. We thank you that you are gracious and that you are patient with us. You are merciful. And I thank you for each one that came out this morning to hear your word. And I thank you for each one that is doing your word. And I thank you that as we go from here, that the Holy Spirit won't leave us alone if we just want to live a selfish life, but that he will convict us. And I know that you act in love, Lord. Father, I thank you for each one that is here this morning, and I pray that your presence will be with us as we go from here. So, Lord, may you be glorified, may you be honored, may you be praised. Pray this in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Would you lead us with a closing song?
Thank you very much. I do want to close with a couple of verses out of Numbers. Numbers chapter 6. It says, The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. May the peace of God go with you as you go from here. The Lord bless you. You are dismissed.